Hi, good morning. I'm Gail Rosenthal, and I'm the director of the Sarah and Sam Schofer Holocaust Resource Center at Stockton University. Welcome to all of you. And I talked last night behind all of your backs, those of you that were here <laughs> on Tuesday and or Wednesday are both days to say, you guys are amazing. You're on vacation, you're on vacation time, beautiful weather, and you could be out at the beach or roaming around or doing my favorite thing, shopping, and you've chosen to come to be with us. So we wanna thank you so much. I wanna remind you, and I'm in really big trouble with my friend Irvin and my friend Matt, because I didn't shout this out yesterday. And here is my shout out. This is our fifth annual, um, I'm gonna read it right from the paper, fifth annual Wally and Lutz Hamashlag Summer Educator Seminar. The Hamashlags are Holocaust survivors and they fled to um, Zimbabwe. Uh, Wally, the female, uh, met Lutz when they were living in, when she and her family were living in Zimbabwe. And um, their son, Leonard, has chosen to honor their memory by providing funding for all of you um, to bring all of our workshops that we do during the summer for free. The only thing that we ask of you is to please do the evaluations. And Irvin, can you come on? Can you say a few words about how important those evaluations are and that we're down in our numbers for the evaluations. Am I right? Yes, we probably have only 30% of the evaluations returned. Um, and like Professor Rosenthal stated, um, you know, these programs are free for educators and we try to make these programs um, uh, as as great as possible for you, particularly during the summer. So um, we really not only want to hear your comments and your um, sort of evaluations about the presenters, but we want to hear from you about what you want to learn in future, um, you know, uh, Wally and Lutz Hammerschlag Summer Educator Seminars. Thank you. Thanks. So please, please, it's so important to us. Um, please, we need to get those numbers up so that we can share that with our funders and not only that, share that with our folks um, at Stockton and planning for the future. We have with us uh, Doug Servey, who, Doug, I'd love you to give a shout out. Doug is the executive director of the New Jersey Commission on Holocaust Education. Good morning, everybody. Um, you better fill out your forms. I can tell you that, right? Mine are done, so I don't want to get in trouble with Gail um, <laughs> or Irvin. So, <laughs> um, it's good to see everybody again today for the third day. Um, hopefully, not hopefully, I know it'll be good. I mean, yesterday was awesome. It was actually one of the things that I wanted to, to get information on is the liberators, because I always feel that I, I don't do justice to the liberation, not only the effects that it has on the liberators, but also the survivors. Everybody thinks that things, you know, were great the next day, everything, everybody went home and life lived happily ever after. And I think everybody here realized that that, not, that was not the case. Um, so thank you again for an awesome program. Looking forward to today as well. Uh, just for those that may not have been here the last couple of days, we're having our program August 16th and 17th. If you want to tune in those two days, it's not uh, nine to three. Uh, you'll get, you know, five PD hours, as you will, with, you know, the situation here as well. Uh, Dr. Berenbaum, we spoke with him yesterday. He has a program uh, that he's going to make a presentation. So, and he's the best of the best, needles to say. And we were fortunate to have him on the first day of this. So, Gail, thank you once again for hosting this. Irvin, for all the work that you do in and out of the, in and out of the college, um, it's very much appreciated. And thank you very much. And please include my friend, Matt. Matt is and Matt as well. I have to get to know Matt. I'll come to Matt. Once school starts, I'll come down and harass you. Okay, that, that's a promise. That's <laughs> great. Looking forward to it. Looking forward to it. That's great. And um, my friend and colleague, Steve Marcus, who heads our dual high school credit program in Holocaust and Genocide Studies. I know uh, Steve said he'd like to give a shout out also. 
Good morning, and I'm sure that the third day is going to be just as wonderful as the first and second. Uh, most of you know me, but for those of you who don't, I'm a product of Stockton, bachelor's degree, master's degree in Holocaust and genocide, and I run a dual credit program for New Jersey and other high schools uh, where we offer uh, a high school Holocaust course, we offer the students the opportunity to get four transferable credits. And I'm very happy to see eight of, of our dual credit teachers here. And uh, like, you know, teachers everywhere, I'm sure there will be more joining. So, you know, if you're interested in this, um, Irvin's going to post my email address and uh, at the end of the day, when you get all those uh, those uh, goodies and links, I'm sure uh, that my address will be in there. So good morning, everyone, and welcome, Lori. Thank you. And um, so our total registration has been a little over 75 uh, teachers. So we thank you so much. And just because Lori had asked me this morning about teachers from outside of the United States, Welcome this morning, and we don't know who's here from these countries, but they have registered for one, two, or three days. Good morning, Australia, New Zealand, Greece, Italy, Spain, Germany, uh, Portugal, United Kingdom, Croatia, and Argentina. So thank you so much for joining. And um, we will begin uh, with my friend, uh, uh, Lori Gerson, and I hesitated a minute because I knew there was something I wanted to add and just say that um, for some of us, Lori, we know you're in Jerusalem. I love saying that live from Jerusalem, and we know you're thinking about dinner at this point, and we're just happy that maybe we've already had our breakfast, maybe yes or no. But some of us are not familiar with Yad Vashem. Um, just, you know, a couple sentences, because some folks were on yesterday. But tell us a little bit about Yad Vashem, the work you do. And I know in your PowerPoint, you're going to share with us um, a, about echoes and reflections. I want to say, I want to ask a question. You can just raise your hand. How many of you use Instacart or something like that? where you get stuff delivered to your house. You know what you want, <laughs> but um, nobody uses Instacart? I, I, well, okay, Lori does. Okay. The Israeli version, the Israeli version, but yeah. Yeah, of course. <laughs> well, I have to tell you that I have a daughter that's married. I mean, the kids, they say, oh, call Instacart. They don't realize that mommy keeps the list, right? But, and there are other services. So I think of ex echoes and reflections as our Instacart. I know what I need, okay? And it fills all those needs without me having to go out and shop for it and look for it. In the olden days, you know what I mean, before echoes and reflections, I had to really start looking through resources and we know that all of those resources aren't always legitimate. So that's what we're looking forward to. And the number one question that our students always ask is, I find this to this day, even if they were in dual high school credit, so don't take it personally, Steve Marcus, how come the Jews didn't resist? Because they hear that in other sources, not necessarily in the classroom, but they've been told this. Well, you know. Men and by the way, Gail, they also say, why didn't they do anything? Yeah. Meaning, they, why didn't they leave? Why didn't they, if they, yes. even if they didn't resist? I'm just adding to what you're saying. Yes. Yes. And um, Alexandra Sabruder has, you know, her book, Salvage Pages. I, of I diaries of, um, uh, uh, of children. children. Teenagers. Right. And the first piece we always read is about a, a boy living in um, Berlin. Mm -hmm. And he's very focused on his piano. 
How is he going to take his piano to Palestine, where his parents are telling him? And my students, throughout the whole thing, the whole diary, get very angry at him. Doesn't he know? Well, of course not. I mean, none of us could ever fathom such a thing like that. So that is also that all goes with what you're saying. So I think, Arvin, what we will do in our transition to Yoni, we'll talk a little bit about our Holocaust Center, because I want Lori to be able um, <laughs> to get started since she's in her office and it's getting closer to nighttime. <laughs> and then on our transition, we'll do that. So we spoke prior to today to decide what should Lori do? And I suggested they fought back armed and spiritual resistance during the Holocaust because our students want to hear the hope. They want to hear about what happened and that excuses expression. But this was very commonly said. The Jews went like sheep to the slaughter. Lori. Okay, so first of all, thank you, Gail. Um, and I just want to add two words from um, somebody who was in the Holocaust. You may well know um, from Janusz Korshak. I want to add to what you spoke about with educators being here during the summer. Um, and I want to quote him, what he said, and um, leave you with those thoughts. And I give you a lot of credit for all that you do. And he says, I don't know if you've heard this before. He said, those who, I'm paraphrasing, but obviously he said it, I believe in Polish. Um, those who worry about the days to come, they plant wheat. Those who worry about the years to come, they plant trees. And those who worry about the generations to come, they educate. And so, <clears throat> And as everybody here today, we're worried about going into the future where uh, Holocaust memory is. We're also worried about our students and the fu their future and their well-being. And very much so, we believe that teaching the Holocaust, um, aside from the fact that it's a history that they need to know, uh, can very much be a part of not just their making them into successful students, but successful human beings. Um, so that's going to be a li little bit of our goal today. Now, Yad Vashem, I just want to Gail asked me to talk about Yad Vashem. Everybody knows, or people, I believe, know that Yad Vashem is a museum. It's the we, we have the history museum here, uh, what we call the Mountain of Remembrance. And we also have our education, uh, our, our resource center, and we have the administration, and we have the um, uh, the scholars that, that are housed here. But I work in what's called the International School. Um, and you see I'm in an office, there's classrooms. And right now, as we speak, uh, we have teachers from across America, we have teachers from France, we have teachers from some Spanish speaking country, I don't know which one. <laughs> I know my colleagues, uh, they're all roaming the hallways. Uh, Louise, you remember from when, from when you were here at Yad Vashem, they're roaming the hallways and day in and day out, they are coming to Yad Vashem and learning about how to teach the Holocaust in the classroom. Okay, so what we're doing here now, but uh, much more intense and in person live. Um, so with that introduction, I'd like to get started today with our topic, which is really one of my favorite topics to talk about. I, I, I love talking about um, liberation and return to life, like uh, was mentioned before, but this is also one of my, now, oh, I forgot to share my screen. Hold on, um, I need to do that. So everybody bear with me for one moment. You'd think by now I would know how to use Zoom, right? <laughs> um, so let me uh, go to share screen. Let's see if that worked and we will go here. Everybody, one moment, we'll get all set up. Okay, there we go. We're all good. Everybody can see. Okay, so we're talking about you see here it says they fought back armed and spiritual resistance during the Holocaust. Um, I just want to show you Gail mentioned echoes and reflections. If you're not familiar with the website, like Gail said, it's like Instacart. Uh, you see here is the main page for echoes and reflections. We say this, we don't recommend it, but we say you could roll out of bed and teach the Holocaust um, to your students that day using echoes and reflections. Like I said, it's not recommended, but you could because you'll see here, if you go to the website, this is the main page and you would see if you go over here to teach, okay, then it takes you to a page over here where you have all these different options. Um, 
you have pedagogy for, for instructions, which would be very useful to teachers. But as you see, we have your lesson plans. And if you click on that, it will take you to a page that looks like you, it takes you, it opens up a menu. And you see here, we have all of the different chapters and lesson plans that we have available for you. There's probably way more information than you would need, but certainly it's very, very usable. And it tells you exactly how to use the information we give you in the classroom. And so, for example, you can see here, um, here we have the chapter that we have on resistance. Okay, the lesson plan on Jewish resistance. Now you see here, we quote a survivor by the name of Roman Kent. He says, resistance does not have to be with a gun and a bullet. So you get an idea of what we're talking about today. So we're actually gonna start with his, a little, um, with a little part of the interview that he gives. So I hope everybody can hear and you'll let me know if you can. In ghetto, there was a creation of, of a certain, call it the communist uh, movement. And some of the leaders in the communist movement, some of them were very good friends of mine that we went to school together. Uh, they they organized, and particular our resort was excellent to it, that we did what we would call it here in the United States, like slow down strikes. Uh, when the management wanted us to do 10 pieces a day, we would do only two. And, uh, and we realized that the management would be afraid to do anything to us because if they openly would say that, hey, you've got a slowdown strike, they would be punished by the Germans. So in a way, we were playing them against the Germans and we are saving our lives by very low production. So uh, I say this because in many instances I heard so many times being said that uh, the Jews didn't do anything. Uh, they went like a sheep to the, uh, to the uh, ovens. But it's not true because this was also a resistance. Resistance does not have to be with a gun and a bullet. As a matter of fact, sometimes the easiest resistance is with a gun and a bullet. But many times the consequences of taking a gun and shooting a German would be that they would take 100 other people and kill them. So that would not accomplish much. But a resistance like this is a resistance. A resistance when a mother gave a piece of bread to the child so that he could survive, it is a resistance. <coughs> a resistance was in the Lodge Ghetto that we had symphony orchestra. And this orchestra played and it was called. But by playing in Ghetto, they gave the people the will to live another day and another day and another day. Yes, it was maybe not legal, but it was a resistance. A teacher that was teaching the children in ghetto, it was resistance, it was illegal. So that there are many other forms of, of resistance, which is spiritual and moral and so on. Okay, so that's exactly what we are going to discuss today. Um, different kinds of resistance. Okay, so I wanted to bring, yes. May I add something before you move on? Sure. I had to ask your, I just want everybody to know that I had asked your permission prior. I knew Roman Kent. He died about a year ago. I, you know, a year to year and a half ago. And Roman told the story. My dog, Lala. And if Irvin, if you would put Lala in the uh, chat, it's just, yes, Lala. Uh, also resisted. They were so close with their dog, Lala. Lala was pregnant. And right before they were deported to the ghetto, the Lodge ghetto, and uh, Irvin, would you write Lodge ghetto, uh, please, which in Polish it's Łódź ghetto. Um, they were deported and it was so tearful leaving Lala, brand newborn puppies in their home, but they had to do it. The first night they were in the ghetto, they 
moved around to several places and finally settled in. The second night, as they were trying to fall asleep in these cramped quarters, Lala appears and stays with them the whole night. And what Lala did every day, she ran home to feed her puppies. And at night came to stay with Roman and his family. And one evening she got caught and you know what happened. The book is beautiful. It's a children's book. I could read that book to my kindergarten uh, granddaughter. Of course, I wouldn't explain the whole, you know, I would only show her parts of the book because Lala was beautiful. By the way, a mutt and uh, probably like half German shepherd and other large animal type of things. We do have the book in our Holocaust Center and it's one of my treasures. And I wish this was my quote, but it's Rabbi Ellie Rubenstein, who is the Canadian head of Holocaust education for Canada and, and is one of the leaders of March of the Living. And he always says, tells the story of Roman Kent and the dog and Lala the dog and says, if animals could have been like humans, perhaps the Holocaust would not have happened because Lala knew <laughs> loyalty and came to the family every evening. So Roman Kent means a lot to all of us. And he lived not, he lives, lived in the New York area. Thank you for letting me interrupt, sure. but it's a book okay. that I share with my students. Okay, well, well, thank you. And that's interesting that you mentioned we're about to get to the Lodge Ghetto in a minute. I'll talk about that. So they'll know, they'll have a little more understanding of how much that meant to Roman when he was in the Lodge Ghetto. Um, our discussion, of course, I just bring a little bit of background just um, to remind ourselves of the conditions that the Jews found themselves in, because we have to remember that all the stories I'm about to talk about, um, they take place in the backdrop or with the uh, knowing of the horrible conditions that the Jews were in in most of the ghettos. OK, in a lot of the ghettos. So, for example, in the Warsaw Ghetto, I just remind people when we talk about you can see here I have a map this pictorial map of Warsaw. And you can see that the big area over here, Warsaw itself, 30% of Warsaw was Jewish before the war. Okay, the only other Jewish community that was bigger than the Jewish community in Warsaw was the Jewish community at, at the time was the Jewish community in New York. Okay, it was the second largest Jewish community in the world. 30% of Warsaw was Jewish. When they made the ghetto, they took that 30% of the population, the 30% that was 30% that was Jewish, and they put it into an area of the ghetto that was 2.5% area, meaning 30% of the population in an area that was 2.5%. And if that wasn't bad enough, they then brought in another 150,000 Jews from neighboring villages, and they put them in the Warsaw Ghetto. So at the height of the Warsaw Ghetto, there are close to 450,000 Jews living there. And that's why we have images like this where you can't even move, you can't even walk in the street. Look at this, they're, they're literally hanging out the windows. And you can see, you can't walk in the street without getting elbowed, without getting shoved. They had to make some of the streets one way for walking. Okay, so if we talk about the Ludge Ghetto, you can see, I just have some, some, some information. The ghetto, it was completely what we called closed or hermetically sealed. What does that mean? It was virtually impossible to, uh, they didn't work outside the Ludge Ghetto. There was no way to be outside and then smuggle food in. And it was virtually impossible to get out of the ghetto to get food. So we call it hermetically sealed. They were completely dependent on what the Germans allowed to come into the ghetto. Okay, so that meant you can see here in the yellow square, the bread was distributed once every eight, five to eight days, right? An average of eight to 10 people lived in each room. 63% of the homes did not even have bathrooms. It was in the, the slum of the city of Lodz. Less than 2% of the homes were connected to cooking gas and heating by that by, by the same token. In fact, it was so bad in the Lodge ghetto that they report in the Lodge chronicles that the Jewish council was keeping there, 
they actually report that on, in January of 1941, that there was a family that woke up with a very strange situation. What was that situation? They were on the third floor of their building, everybody in this apartment. And during the night, their, their stairwell had been stolen because it was made out of wood. That's how desperate the people were to stay warm or to cook those few potatoes they had. So they were actually, they stole everything that was wood, including the wood around outhouses. We have to think of how desperate people are if they're taking wood from outhouses. Okay, and we see here it says that 21% of the people died as a result of starvation. The living conditions are what they call the ghetto disease. And I would um, suggest to you that that number would be even higher had they not taken the Jews out at, at certain intervals to take them to be murdered in the camps. Okay, but we get an idea of how horrible the conditions were. So I just want to give you that um, background so that whatever we talk about now, I would assume would have even more meaning. Okay, all the actions that we are going to learn about take place with that in mind. Now, now I'm taking you to the Vilna ghetto, and I'm introducing you to Dr. Abraham Weinreb. And you can see it's a picture here. This is not him in the picture. I just brought you um, this picture for illustrative purposes, but he did work in the um, hospital that they had in the Vilna ghetto. Now, Dr. Weinreb did survive, and he tells us a very interesting thing that, that happened to him. He relates a story, and he's talking about being a doctor, about being somewhat of a leader in the camps, um, um, in, excuse me, in the ghettos, so to speak. And he talks about how um, that at one point in the winter of 1942 in the Vilna ghetto, they had patients, um, and all of a sudden they realized these patients were ill with, with tuberculosis. And at that time, they thought that calcium was, would, would, would help them, okay? So what they did was they realized though, they all knew that they had a limited supply of calcium and that there wouldn't be calcium coming in, okay? They had a pretty good hunch. They, they couldn't get any more calcium. So if you think about it, all of a sudden, Dr. Weinreb has what we could say, this moral dilemma, right? How is he gonna allocate the medication? What options does he have? He has a limited medicine and X number of people who are sick. So if you think about it, he really has two options, right? One is he could give everybody an equal amount of medication. And when it runs out, it runs out. Or what could he do? He could assess all of the patients and see, well, maybe um, there are some who are healthier and have a better chance of survival. There are the patients who are so sick, they'll probably die anyway. So why don't I give the medication to the ones who have a better chance of surviving? Okay. Now, um, he didn't know what to do. He really didn't know. So what he did was he didn't want to make the decision, the, the decision alone. He called together, so to speak, a committee. And he got together a judge, rabbi, a doctor, another communi a, commu a community leader, and he asked them what he should do. And the answers he got basically were the judge said, well, I can't condemn somebody to death because if I say you don't give them medicine, I'm condemning them to death. I can't do that without a trial, without them committing a crime, right? And the rabbi said, well, only God determine, determines who dies. I don't. And the doctor said, like you, I have no idea. And the community leader said, well, this is beyond my scope. Like, I, you know, I, I can't help you. And so what, I, what Dr. Weinreb did at that time was he gave everybody an equal amount. And what happened? They all died. They all died. All the patients died. They didn't have enough medication. And then a few months later, the same situation comes up with diabetes and a limited supply of insulin. And again, Dr. Weinreb doesn't know what to do. So he says, he calls the committee together again, and he tells them what happened. Last time I gave it to everyone, they all died. Do you think I should do it the other way this time? Should I only give it to the ones who are more healthy? And you know what they all answer? They, they give the same answers. We can't help you. So Dr. Weinreb this time decides to give it only to the ones who are, who, who are the healthiest amongst them. And so what happens this time? They all die in the end. They all die. Now, I bring this to you because, first of all, this is a moral dilemma. And it's also something that we call what we could call a choiceless choice. It's a choice that nobody should ever have to make, a choice where any outcome is, is bad. But I also bring it to you because I want to... I want you all to think about if I were in a classroom, I'd ask you this question, but you know, in a webinar, it's a little harder, but I want everybody to think for a minute. When Dr. Weinreb called the committee and the committee came, what did all these people deep down inside, what did they know? What did they know? They all knew that all these patients would eventually die. They all knew that no matter what they chose to do, 
there wasn't enough medication to save these people and no medication would, would be coming in. So why did they go through this, so to speak? We could almost say charade. I wouldn't call it that, but why did they go through that? And the reason why is when we talk about resistance and especially spiritual resistance, on the one hand, we, we think of keeping up spirits and we'll see that 100%. But we also have to remember sometimes resistance is just trying to hold on to your your humanity when it's being taken away from you okay and, and another way we say it it's it, it's continuity in a world of chaos so dr weinreb asked this question because that's what he would have done before if he had enough medication but he didn't have enough and it was coming in he would have done the same thing he would have called and it's that the asking the question here that is the resistance I want everybody to understand it's the asking of the question. It's the people coming to the committees that nobody said to him. It's really, he does not record that anybody said, oh, come on, you know, they're all going to die anyways. Why are you asking us? They go through their logical answers. They may not help him, but they go through because that's what they would have done. And so I want everybody to have, we're going to see what, uh, our discussion through that prism, this idea of holding onto your humanity when it's being taken away from you or continuing in a world of chaos, so to speak. Okay. So you might not be, you might be surprised um, that the first, you, 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 when we think of spiritual resistance, just like Roman Ken said, many times we think of maybe prayers that the Jews um, had, we, uh, that they, the prayer services that they conducted, or we think of the concerts, like you mentioned, but would you believe I'm bringing to you laundry? The first thing I'm bringing to you is laundry, and this is in the Vilna ghetto. And I want you to see something I found when I was doing research a few years ago when I was first delving into this topic. I want you to see what I found. I think it's remarkable. I am bringing you the web page, all right, from the, you can see here, right, the American Public Health Association. It's from February of 2015. And look what they write. Public health in the Vilna ghetto as a form of Jewish resistance. And I want to bring it to one paragraph. It's, it, Google it and find it. It's really a remarkable, remarkable. It, it's not long, but really um, a remarkable uh, article. And you can see here, I just brought you one paragraph. Look what they write. We describe the system of public health that evolved in the Vilna ghetto as an illustrative, illustrative example of Jewish innovation and achievement during the Holocaust. Furthermore, we argue that by cultivating a sophisticated system of public health, the ghetto inmates enacted a powerful form of Jewish resistance, directly thwarting the intention of the Nazis to eliminate the inhabitants by starvation, epidemic, and exposure. In doing so, we aim to highlight applicable lessons for the broader public health literature. We hope that this unique story may gain its rightful place in the history of public health as an insightful case study of creative and progressive solutions to universal health problems in one of the most challenging environments imaginable. And I think this is truly remarkable because, I mean, not only were they, so to speak, doing things, as we, we said before, but they were even, you can see here, trailblazers. So much so that 80 something years later, we're looking back and saying that if, if we have a place in the world, right, where they, where they have, um, they're having difficulties in, 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 with the spread of disease and cleanliness and hygiene, where can they look? to the Jews and the Holocaust and how they dealt with the situation. I think it's truly remarkable. Okay, so I wanted to bring that to you. Now, um, the next thing we have here is what Roman Kemp brought. He, he, he talked about keeping up the spirits and having concerts. And certainly we have that in the ghettos. What I bring to you here, these are posters from the Vilna ghetto. They were found after the war was over, a whole collection of posters that really shed light onto what, um, the Jewish life in the Vilna ghetto and what they were doing um, in reaction to their to their situation. You can see here, I'm going to flip it over because it's Yiddish. You can see here the English. We have a puppet show, right? And here you can see we have an entire week full of performances. And not only do we have a whole week of performances, so I just thought the puppet show was really neat for the children. You see here a whole week of puppet shows, but I want to show you in the midst of all the public, the puppet shows here, they have, excuse me, all, of all the performances, they have a memorial service dedicated to one of their colleagues, which I also just think is a beautiful uh, demonstration of continuity because they're living, the Vilna ghetto was um, in the Eastern part of Poland that wasn't, um, wasn't conquered by the Germans until 
1941, in the wake of Operation Barbarossa, when they invade the Soviet Union. So the Germans didn't come in, but the ghetto is established in the wake of tens of thousands of Jews already being murdered. Okay, unlike Ludge and the Warsaw Ghetto, where they were established, and then, and then the murder came later. Here, tens of thousands of Jews were murdered. The Jews heard those rumors. The rumors were trickling back. They knew that. And yet they still go on with life and they have these, these concerts. When I show you that even with that, they still single out a colleague of theirs with all that murder, it's important for them to continue and to give him the credit that they thought he deserved as one of their colleagues. Okay, so I really think that that's beautiful. Now, um, speaking of these performances, it's actually very interesting because um, the performances on the, you know, they, they could be viewed, even though we understand why they had them, they could be viewed almost as being, uh, we could kind of ask how could they have had these performances when life is so difficult or when people are literally starving on the street, like, for example, you've all seen the, the, the images in the Warsaw Ghetto, people starving on the streets and other people are going to the theater. It seems it, it seems almost incredulous that some of the Jews were, were doing that. And in the Vilna Ghetto, they actually debated amongst themselves in the beginning before they set up the ghettos. OK, so they reported a year later on what they had argued about a year before in their newspaper. Look what they wrote. It says here you can see on the occasion of the one year anniversary of the ghetto theater. They say we wish to take this opportunity to express certain opinions. They're remembering way back when, a year before. Well, what did the critics say? They said, theater, this is entertainment. And in the ghetto, there is no place for entertainment. OK, but the other people said, but it was said that concerts, right? It, it, it shouldn't be conducted in a cemetery. This is true. But now life itself is a cemetery. It's forbidden to be weak. We must be strong in our spirit and our bodies. I am convinced that the Jewish life developed here and the Jewish fire burning and our hearts will redeem us from these troubles. And so they did have the concerts. And a year later, they, you see here, they say, the visitors say it's a refuge for people who wish to flee their homes, flee reality. People want to forget what was going on at home. And if it works out, they can even forget where they are for several hours. And that is to the credit of the actors and the illustrators who are capable of providing this, this refuge. And I want to add something here. Um, very clearly, we can see that theater can be an escape. But I want to share with you something that Tamar Machado, who's a musicologist, she comes to Yad Vashem and she lectures and that she shares with us. And she says, now think about this. I, I, I described to you how overcrowded it was and, and, and how horrible their lives were. And especially you saw in the Ludge ghetto, eight to 10 people per room. And in the Warsaw ghetto, 50 people to an apartment. You saw how the streets were. When one person goes to the theater and they have their ticket and they give the ticket to the usher, where does the usher take them to? Their seat. Now imagine a Jew living in the conditions that we just spoke about, what it meant to them to go to a theater and just have their own space, even if it was just for an hour or an hour and a half, right? Maybe they didn't even care what they were showing. In fact, uh, in David Cherkoviak, um, in, 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 he was a teenager in the, in the Ludge Ghetto. In his diary, he's, he, was a tr he was tremendously intelligent. And um, he actually ends up recording, unfortunately, pretty much his own death. And his diary was found after the war. And he talks about these uh, theaters, these performances. He goes, and he went to one of them. He goes, eh, it really wasn't so good at all. But at least I was out of my house. OK, so so you understand the, the idea there. Uh, we see here, I was just pointing those things out. And I brought you some images from, uh, we have, these are in the Warsaw Ghetto. You can see this is a wedding taking place on stage in the left-hand corner over there. This is a play in the Vilna Ghetto. Here are the theaters outside. This is outside the, the theater in the Warsaw Ghetto. I don't know if you can read it here. Oops, I, sorry about that. Uh, you can see here, it's called the El Dorado, the theater. I thought was so, so interesting, the, the El Dorado. And over here, this is, a ch this is a children's play in the Ludge Ghetto. And I also brought you this image because I love this image. This is a concert taking place in the Ludge Ghetto. And look at their, they're wearing their uh, costumes, right? They're, the uniforms they wear. And I just think it's so beautiful because it shows they don't just want to perform. They want to perform the exact same way they did before. Even in the cramped quarters, whatever they can recreate that was like the life they had before, we see they're doing it again. And I also want to share with you here, I have, um, this is so interesting. I found out, I also discovered this, that when they were doing the plays in the Vilna Ghetto, the last play they did before the Germans came and took everybody out of the ghetto, before they liquidated the ghetto, was a play called um, 
it was a Swedish play that translates to the sin flood. And now you can see here, I have two movie posters. Twice it was made into a movie in Hollywood. Okay, you can see here, it's called The Sin Flood. The second time, I think a decade later, it's called The Way of All Men. Okay, and what The Sin Flood, just to, so you understand what, what it was about, it, it is takes place in a Western saloon, right? Down somewhere south, like cowboys, think cowboys. And it, basically there, there, there was an area that had flooded before. We're talking about floods that they're having now in in the St. Louis area, there, there were floods. And so uh, there were a bunch of people who knew each other and had relationships and they were in this saloon and uh, it started raining and raining. And so this, this saloon had hermetically sealed doors because of the flood they had had in the past. And so they shut the doors. Now what happens is once they shut the doors, right? What happens? Well, they have limited food, they have limited oxygen, they have the, right? There, there's, there's problems that start to take place. And the candle's burning and the flame is going down and they realize time is running out and they're all trying to decide what to do. Should some of us just leave? Should some of us stay? Should we? And they go on and on and on. And finally, after all these debates, they decide that they're all going to just open the doors. The water will rush in. They'll all die together. OK, so there's not fear to pick somebody. So how does this how does the play end? They open the doors and they didn't realize the rain had stopped and it was shining and they were all saved. Now, can we understand how a play like this spoke to the Jews? in the Vilna ghetto while the Holocaust was happening, right? We very much can, right? It gave, not only was it an escape, but it was escape that had message and had hope. It gave them um, um, thoughts that maybe they could survive. Now, it's interesting. I also learned the play they were planning on doing that was going to be the next play, but never happened because the Germans came was Fiddler on the Roof which of course wasn't Fiddler on the Roof. I'm sure everybody here is familiar with that play. It wasn't Fiddler on the Roof at that time. It was Tevya the Milkman, I believe it was called, because um, Fiddler on the Roof was, um, was adapted from a very uh, famous Yiddish uh, story. But um, I just think it's, you know, we, we have it now. So we talk about continuity. They were performing, they were performing Fiddler on the Roof then, and we, we have Fiddler on the Roof now. Okay. Um, also here we have classes. I know we uh, that that Roman Kent me mentioned the students having classes. Now look at this. I'm going to flip it over. You can see attention, young people. Uh, we have these these lectures you can go to: physics, chemis chemistry, literature. And look at look at what time they're at. 7:30 o'clock at night. This is 7:30 at night. Seven o'clock. 7:30. Why at night? Because the children are in labor all day. They're working. Now. We think of our students, right, and the times they complain they have to be in class, but imagine having to go to class after an entire day of forced labor, okay? So I thought that was um, something that you're, you know, we're talking about school. I want to share with you here the words of a young boy who did not survive um, from the Vilna ghettos. We're talking about the Vilna ghetto. He was Yitzchak Rudashevsky. He was 14 years old. And look what he writes about school, okay, and about um you can see here, it says, for me, the drive to learn was a rebellion against the present. I was determined to live in the future and not the present. If of 100 children in the ghetto my age, 10 could learn, I had to be among them to take advantage of this opportunity. Okay, and you'll see here again, David Cherkoviak, who I just mentioned before, the one who talked about going to the plays, look at his words about going to school and what it meant to the, ch the students, the children who were, who were in the ghettos. Tomorrow is the first day of school. Who knows how our dear school has been? My friends are going there tomorrow to find out what's cooking. Well, I have to stay home. I have to. My parents say that they are not going to lose me yet. Oh, my dear school, damn the times when I complained about getting up in the morning and about tests. If only I could have them back. OK, so we see this drive to learn and going back to the echoes and reflections. I'm actually in the unit you can see here um, in the Vilna Ghetto. They, you can see I'm back to the posters. They had a celebration of you can see here again, Yitzchak Rudashevsky, who we saw before. Look what he records in his ghetto. Today, there was a celebration in the ghetto, the loan of the hundred thousand thousand. I can't say that book from the ghetto library. There was a celebration da, 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 and read what he said. He goes on here. Um, reading books in the ghetto is the biggest treat that there is. Books link us to freedom. Books connect us to the world. The loan of the hundred thousand book is a great achievement for the ghetto and the ghetto can be proud of it. OK, um, so I thought I wanted to share that with you. Um, because also when we talk about the ghettos, aside from the starvation, disease and the cold, we have to remember the isolation. 
And I love how he says it connects us to the world. I think we're going to see that again in a little bit. Sports, right? Would your students think that sports, right, is something um, for them to, that, that that would be something that they'd uh, learn spiritual resistance from? But you see here, this is, this is an inscription on the wall that was surrounding the sports field in the Vilna ghetto. Wait, I'm looking here. I'm supposed to hit, wait, it looks like ooh, something. Okay. In the Vilna ghetto. And they, um, they spoke about this sports field. And we have a testimony where they say that if we don't survive, and if nothing else survives, the sports field will attest to our our spirits, the spirits that we had in the ghetto. And we have posters actually of the sporting events that took place. Okay. Now I think maybe that was, okay. Now we're talking about the students and we're talking about the children and I'm taking you to a different ghetto now. That was the Vilna ghetto. I'm taking you now to the Theresienstadt ghetto. And I want to show you something else that I think, especially if you're teaching middle school, this, um, is can be very useful and meaningful. This comes from one of the publications that they had. Um, there were two magazines that were produced by children that we know of in the Theresienstadt ghetto, or ghetto slash camp. And it was the only ghetto that we know of that had characteristics of a camp because the men and women lived separate from each other. And therefore the children lived in children's bunkers and they had counselors. OK, and in some of those bunkers, they produced publications and this one's called Comrade, which translates to what it sounds like comrade, meaning friend. And you see here, here's one of the pages from that magazine. But look, they have here a fun corner. Now, remember, these are children pup who are, who are, who are um, they're making this magazine for themselves. So first of all, we, again, we think of children in forced labor all day. And what do they think about still having fun? Okay, so the fact that we even have a fun corner, that we even have a publication. And look what they, first, I think it's super interesting what they expect their friends to know. They expect their friends, and, and, and Theresa Stott was in Czechoslovakia outside of Prague. They expect them to know, you can see here, list 10 rivers in North America. Can your students list 10 rivers in North America, right? <laughs> and you're in North America. So it's really interesting to see what they expect them to know. List 12, five well-known operas and their composers. Right. I think they must have been very cultured, cultured youngsters. But look what they say here. And this is really what I, what, I want, what I want to get to. Answer honestly without using an atlas. Now, think about that. I mean, today, I think we'd say answer honestly without using Google, right, or without using your smartphone. But answer honestly without using an atlas. And what I want to remind everybody is that these are children who are living in a world that is anything but fair. Right. They've been torn from their homes, torn from their communities, torn from their families, even in this case, torn from their friends, everything they know. And but what are they demanding from each other? They're demanding that they should be fair. And they should be honest with each other. So I think it's really, truly a remarkable um, show of resistance and resilience and strength of character. And think about, it, especially in middle school, where our, our students are developmentally, where they're, you know, they're forming their own world of values. I think this can really be a very meaningful lesson uh, for young students today. Um, now, when we're talking about those publications, I just want to introduce you to a youngster by the name of Peter Gins. Um, and a really remarkable young boy who was in also in the Trains Stock Ghetto. And he was the publisher of the other magazine that we have a collection from that survived called Vedem. Vedem means we will lead. Um, and you can see here, he was a remarkable artist. Uh, he also had written, I believe, five science fiction novels even before he went to the ghetto. Um, and you see here the cover of one of his magazines. Now you can see that he draws this image. It's very much is a battle scene. It is a scene of resistance, but what is this cannon made out of? You can see very clearly it's made out of paper. Not only is it made out of paper, it's made out of his magazine. And what is he telling? He's literally screaming, shouting out to the world, we will fight back with what? With our magazine, with our paper. And over here, these words, they translate to satire, mirth, and humor. And that's what we'll fight back with. We'll fight back our horrible conditions using our words, 
using our humor, right? And 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 that will be our resistance. So I think this, if uh, nothing else symbolizes what we're talking about today, this is it. It's he literally shows using a pen as his weapon. Okay, so I wanted to bring you that. When we talk about the children, and Gail, you mentioned um, Alexandra's um, Zupriter and her salvage pages. She says something. These diaries that are left. Let's, she says it so so beautifully that I wanted to bring you her words exactly. She says, perhaps most important of all, the they, the diaries that we're seeing stand as markers of people in time, those who wrote themselves into existence when the world was trying to erase their presence. And she says, as, as such, they are tools for pedagogy to be sure, but they are also a reminder of the singular power of the written word. Okay, so I just think it's a beautiful, beautiful message. And when we're talking about now the recordings that people left behind and documentation, um, I'm bringing you now back to the Warsaw Ghetto, and maybe some people are familiar with the Onik Shabbat. It was the underground archive that they had um, in the Warsaw Ghetto. Emmanuel Ringelblum was the head of it. He was the historian, and also the he was also um, in uh, he also helped with the, uh, all the aid that happened in the Warsaw Ghetto, and. He ran this with, uh, he gathered about 60 people together and they ran the Onik Shabbat. And um, they they did research, Here, here's a picture of him, you can see they did research. And some of the things they even did is they said, as long as we're ill, we will do, um, we will do tests on, on um, different diseases. And they studied the effects of hunger as long as they had to. And you see here, we have the words written of a woman by the name of Cecilia Slapek. Now, Cecilia Slapek um, was a woman that that Emmanuel Ringelblum he he commissioned her for the Onik Shabbat to do, believe it or not, a study on women, a study on women and the effects of the war and then going into the ghetto, and she managed to follow and study 17 women from all different ages and all different classes in the ghetto, so to speak, different social classes and different um, with different careers that they did beforehand. Some were mothers, some weren't, some were married, some weren't. And um, unfortunately, her research got cut off because uh, the Jews were taken away. But I bring this to you because again, just like we talked about laundry, and we talked about um, the Jews and the, their efforts to minimize disease and stay clean in the Vilna ghetto. When I was when I when when I first learned about this, and I was thinking the idea of of women's studies again, I did a little research, and if somebody knows differently, correct me. But from what I could find out, the first study uh, or or formal study of women was, wasn't until 1956 in Australia. And the first time that there's ever an, accred an accredited women's studies course in the US wasn't until 1969 in Cornell University. And so we see here again, not only are they um, active and they are, um, shall we say historians and researchers are doing what they would have done, right? They're holding on to their humanity. They're, they're continuing in the path that they, that they always um, led before. They're also, again, they're trailblazers in what they're doing. They're literally ahead of their times. So I think it's truly remarkable and I wanted to bring you that. Now, uh, moving on, and you can see here, I'm just giving you different examples of different kinds of resistance, okay? So here we have art. Art is resistance, and we see this uh, painting or this sketch watercolor was done. Nellie Toll, and she was a young girl that was in hiding with her mother, um, and they were in hiding, and her mother gave her watercolors and paper so that she could pass the time. And I like to use this because, first of all, I always ask students, and you see this, you say, was that what she, she was in hiding? Is this what she was seeing before her? What was she seeing before? She's seen the walls of a room, but what was she painting? And we see that she can still imagine the beauty of the world. And not only that, we also see a coping mechanism and lots of different, you know, this, so, so and if, if a teacher, an educator is bringing something like this into the classroom, uh, we can see the strength of spirit again, right? Her resilience and still imagining, or maybe she was a girl that always loved fashion. And so she remembers what she saw or she's dreaming of what she'll have in the future. 
But again, we see and this idea of coping mechanisms and we live in a world where, you know, our, our, our students have bad news at their fingertips. They're, and they don't just get traumatic news once a day. You know, they don't get it. They're getting it literally every hour on the hour when something bad happens, whether it's a building collapse or there is an, a there's a there's an, a, a, an attack somewhere or there's a war across the world. But they're getting updates every hour on the hour. And I don't have to tell you as educators that, you know, there's studies being done now on the levels of the rise and levels of anxiety amongst young adults. And one of the one of the reasons given is because of that, because of the constant access to bad news. And here we see the ability to see the beauty in the world. OK, so I think that's something um, that I wanted to, sh to bring with you when we're talking about this idea of spiritual resistance. Lori, now, before yeah. you move on. Yeah. Um, if you could go back to the slide, please. Yeah. Nellie Toll was a friend. And oh. those of you that were on the Zoom yesterday remember me talking about her book behind the secret window where right, she, and she yeah i'm sorry no go ahead go on go on yeah and um from that like cupboard kind of uh, structure she hid between that and the window itself uh she lived not too far from stockton university she was a wow. friend of oh, our wow. center I and know. i highly recommend her book for high school mm -hmm. junior high um, a, a students, it's very easy reading. It's probably on the fourth grade level. There's nothing scary, by the way, in the book. Mm -hmm. And it's not only about what happened and how this neighbor took them in, but while they were in hiding, um, they did knitting and crocheting. And a neighbor, another neighbor, came in unexpectedly. They ran behind the window and here the yarn unraveled all across the floor and the neighbor came in and she just stepped over it. She mm -hmm. never said, this is so odd and why, you know? And so it's all about rescue, resistance, resilience. And Lori, I just wanna compliment you. This was brilliant what you just said about how some of these acts of resistance are comfort to our students today because violence in schools, I'm embarrassed to say, but it's our headlines in our newspaper. And our students live with this, some of our students, I don't want to say any, all of them, mm -hmm. live with this mm -hmm. fear. And again, I just, those that were on yesterday, I'm sorry to repeat this, but uh, we have a memoir writing project and we have mm -hmm. a memoir um, a Partisan's Revenge, and a student recently read it. And afterwards, he said to me, confided in me, I gave my book to my father to read. I thought, okay, that's nice. I'm happy. But then he said, my father has been depressed because mm -hmm. his brother died suddenly. He had undiagnosed pancreatic cancer. Mm -hmm. And my father said, if Sidney Simon could overcome witnessing his brother's death and becoming a partisan, I can overcome. Wow. So we don't know where that comfort comes from, but truly that book changed that family's life. Right. So, you know, these stories are very impactful. So right. I just wanted to share that and sh tell you, I know you're getting closer to going home. We're getting closer to <laughs> lunchtime, but not exactly. So you have 10 minutes left because Irvin, do we have any questions oh that have been posed? We have many questions, yes. Oh, okay, good. So Lori. <laughs> okay, I'm, fine. I'm, I'm, gonna, yeah. I'm gonna run. I'm gonna run okay. I'm gonna quick. All quick. right. Okay, so, okay, I'll share with you just a few more things here. Um, humor, humor being used as resistance. Okay, so Emmanuel Ringelblum, aside from the archive that he kept, he helps, he himself kept a diary. And it's, to me, it's also fascinating what he, not only did he record what was going on, there were a few times where he said, the Jews of the future will want to know what, 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 So one of them was what the Jews read in the Warsaw Ghetto. So one of them, he says, the Jews of the future will want to know what jokes they were telling in the Warsaw Ghetto. So I'm going to share with you one of the jokes. Okay. And this is what he writes. 
you can see here, right, the star that they had to wear the band. Now it's not the yellow star, but that's what they had to wear in the general government part of Poland. It looked more like the with the Israeli flag today with the white with the blue star. And he writes, this was a joke. Now Levski Street, which, which was one of the major Jewish streets, looks like Hollywood nowadays. Everywhere you go, you see a star. Okay, and that was really one of the jokes that they were telling in the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, so you know what, we're going to jump ahead here if I only have 10 minutes, but we're going to see here that they very much were active. They, it, and very much they took care of each other. They really tried. You can see here they had orphanages. They had soup kitchens in the Warsaw Ghetto. They had multiple soup kitchens, by the way, underground. So when we think about a soup kitchen, everybody in the Warsaw Ghetto was starving. Everybody was starving the people who were serving the soup and their families were starving at home. And yet they still shared the little food that was coming into the ghetto. They didn't take it home just for themselves. We have to, you know, we can, we can share that with our students. They had child welfare programs when they could, they had refugee centers, the refugees, remember those 150,000 Jews from neighboring villages, right? They, they're, they're brought into Warsaw. They don't, it's not, they're, they're living barely even in apartments. Some of them, they're living in, 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 in huge uh, buildings, schools that were converted to housing and things like that. And we have house committees. Um, the house committees were really a brilliant, I, I think, um, strategy to help in the Warsaw Ghetto. They were so overwhelmed because there were so many people. And you see here, um, you see, I, I tried to enlarge it a little bit, but they had courtyards. The buildings were kind of like, you know, a, a three, the three parts of, of a square. And they opened up into courtyards and they realized they couldn't help everybody at once. And so they divided into house committees. And that meant that in every, in all these three buildings together, those that had more and that were uh, 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 had more strength, maybe more money even, they would be the ones in their building to help those that needed help. And we're talking about taking the things and learning from what the Jews did. And I'm not sure that anybody um, did this knowingly, but in the synagogue that I used to attend when I, when I lived in Chicago, um, in the synagogue there when COVID hit, and it was a big synagogue, there were a lot of members, and they wanted to make sure that nobody fell through the cracks. So what they did is they divided the shul up and everybody in an, in an Orthodox synagogue, they live within walking distance because most uh, Orthodox Jews, they don't use cars, they don't drive. And they divided into blocks and there was uh, and they made WhatsApp groups and there was always a person who was the head of the WhatsApp group. And the idea there was that, you know, that maybe there were some elderly people on the block. Maybe there was a, a single mom. Maybe there was somebody who, who got sick and got COVID and they lost somebody in the family. And the idea was that by this, by, by doing this, they, they would make sure nobody fell through the cracks because it was much smaller and easier to help. So they did that in the Warsaw Ghetto. And the Jews were trying to take care of each other. Um, we talk about the righteous among the nations. What about the righteous among the Jews? The Jews that shared their food, even though they knew that probably they wouldn't have another piece of bread the next day, right? They knew they were risking their lives by sharing that. Now we're moving on into the next part. So I only have a few minutes to do that. Um, I want to bring, I take you now to Auschwitz. Auschwitz, we can see here. Um, I bring to you, Helene, we did a lot in the camps now. I bring to you Helena Birnbaum. Okay, she wrote a, a really a beautiful book. It's not translated very well. The English is a, is a little, uh, sh shall we say, awkward sometimes, but really and it's not, I don't recommend it for young students. It's a very difficult book to read. It's called Hope is the Last to Die by Helena Birnbaum. And she is a survivor of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. She survived a malfunctioning gas chamber in Majdanek, and she survived Auschwitz. And she survived Auschwitz. One of the reasons was because she was in a what's called the Canada Commando. The Canada Commando were the Jews that were um, responsible for going through the items that were left behind by the other Jews. And you can see here what she says they did. She says, most often I worked outdoors tearing up rags or old clothing to make sure they did not get into good things sorted to be sent to Germany by the Nazis. That was their job, to take the good stuff because it was gonna go to the Germans and the bad stuff, they were gonna do whatever they did with it. But, Look what she writes they did, but I usually tore up everything that came to hand, good as well as bad clothes, so that the Nazis had as little use of them as possible. Almost all women I worked with did the same, watching to make sure they were not observed by stormtroopers. Now, why were they watching to make sure they weren't observed by stormtroopers? Because what would have happened to them if they were caught ripping up the good clothes that was supposed to go to the Germans? They would have been killed on the spot. They are risking their lives just for this little resistance that 
nobody would know about. <laughs> but just to have some resistance against the Nazi machine that was against the Jews. Okay, so the Germans would benefit less from what the Jews left behind. And as we go into Auschwitz and sabotage, then we start moving into just a little, I have just a few minutes to get to the armed resistance part of my talk here. Okay, and in Auschwitz, many people don't realize that there was a resistance. There was, um, there was an armed revolt in, in the camp. These, these four women are very well known. They were caught afterwards. They were tortured. Um, they were a part of a group of 20 young women that every day when they were working in the munitions plant for the Germans, they would smuggle out like literally for a year and a half, little teeny pieces of gunpowder. And they smuggled it to the Zinder Commando, the Jews that were working in the gas chambers. And they actually blew up one of the gas chambers. It was, this was in October, 1944. Um, and they were, uh, many Jews were caught and killed. Um, in the wake of that revolt, but people don't know about that. Um, we also have revolts, and you can see in Treblinka, smoke actually rising from the revolt we had there. Um, in Sobibor, many people do know we had the Great Escape when we talk, so we have that. Um, and of course, I spoke about the one in Auschwitz here, I have a picture of the ruins. But when we talk about armed resistance, I do have to take just a few minutes to talk about the difficulty that faced the, I will say that the Jew, any of the Jews, but certainly maybe um, we'll see it was the youth groups that were the ones that held the banner of we should we should um, revolt, we should take up arms against the Jews. I mean, excuse me, against the against the Nazis and the Germans. And it's the youth because first of all, you know, we know that youth they have less that they need to worry about. They have less to lose. They're not married. They don't have children yet. It's the youth that also, you know, they they have that strength of spirit. Um, and you see here, and we talk about continuity. I just I just have to show you this. These are some pictures of youth groups in um, in Europe before the war. Okay, and just to show you continuity, real continuity, I bring you this picture here. It's a youth group called Pnei Akiva, and this is in the 1930s in Poland. Now look at their shirts, and I bring you here two pictures. This is my this is my daughter. My daughter here is right now as we speak. She's a counselor for Bene Kiva, the same youth group that we see here in Poland. Okay, in the 1930s here here in Israel, you see that she's a counselor, and they still wear not exactly the same shirt, but you can see still they have a shirt with a symbol on it. And here's the modern day version of that exact same shirt. Okay, so we talk about continuity. Um, so I wanted to share that with you. Now, it was the youth that were um, arguing the whole time. But when we think about it, what did they have to consider? Right. They couldn't just say, OK, I'll kill. You know, we'll we'll we'll, we'll take up arms. There, there, there were things that they had to think about the risk of collective punishment. I know that Roman Kent mentioned that. Right. That if they kill, I can say, fine, I'll be brave. I don't care. I just want I just want one of the. Um, Nazis to die. But what if you know that your little sister, your grandmother, and 300 random Jews are going to be killed the next day? It's not so easy to be brave, right? Challenging authority. There were the elder, the lower, the, shall we say, the traditional leadership in the ghetto. And not to fault them, but they felt if we just work and we be productive and we do what the Germans want, because in our experience in the past, you know, doing what the authorities wanted is what helped you. So then we'll just survive. OK, so they, they had to kind of butt heads, so to speak. Um, here we have the dilemma of procur procuring weapons, getting weapons. And I, I also have to mention that if, you know, if they have 300 zlotis that come their way, for example, for some reason, the youth. Now, if you've made a decision to revolt, do you use that to purchase a gun in the underground or do you spend that money to hide a Jewish child in the countryside? That's a real decision. That's a dilemma. OK, so it's not so easy to say, well, of course, we're going to buy a gun. Well, maybe you can save a child's life. And that's a decision. It's difficult. Abandoning one's family. Abba Kovner, you can see him pictured right here, the famous Abba Kovner, one of the most celebrated partisan fighters. If, you're, if you don't know him, you can look up who he is. Um, and there's video of him, certainly from the Eichmann trial and things like that. But to the day he died, to the day he died, considered himself the man who abandoned his mother to go into the ghetto. And I just heard a lecture from Dr. Rob Rosette today where I didn't even realize that his mother asked him to go into the forest with him. And he said, I can't take you. They won't take you. And if I have a job to do, which is to fight against the Germans, I can't do that with you. But he lived with that guilt for the rest of his life. OK, here we say the practical considerations. Do they know how to fight? Do they know how to fight? There's one of the ghettos. They didn't even have a gun. They would. They, they would do shooting practice by going 
bang, bang with their hands. They literally, so knowing military training, what did they know? They were youth group leaders, right? What was their job? Their job was education, not, not warfare. Okay, and lastly, knowledge and understanding. You have to understand and know what's happening to you. In the beginning, the Jews had, certainly in the beginning, they had no idea. They, they had no idea. And that's like a whole lecture in, in and of itself. Um, I bring to you the other word we talk about that guilt. Baruch Shub was a survivor. He actually ran um, a partisan's organization here in Israel for many years. And he talks about how you could see here, they would count everyone in the ghetto that he was from. And if somebody was missing, they would threaten to kill a number of Jews. And so he said the pressure from the community, the people said to the youth, don't make trouble. You're putting us in danger, right? It was immense. And he said they were frightened to death. And he says um, a year, he says, for this reason, there was incredible, just to sit quietly. And he talks about how he did leave, right? He says, and he says here, a year afterwards, they couldn't stand the tension anymore. This was already after I had left and they left the town and joined the partisans. The Germans executed all 350 people who were still there. They left only 25 people alive. He said, this still haunts me that I left so irresponsibly and maybe recklessly without thinking about those around me. And he lived with that guilt his entire life. Um, here, um, we're going to have Sorry, to. Sorry, really... I don't mean to cut you short, Yeah, I'm, I'm going to get to the end. I'm going to finish right okay, now. Thank okay? you. Okay. I'm going to jump to the end over here. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. It's totally okay. I just want to show you this is straight from the Echoes and Reflections. You can see we have images from the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And here we have, um, there's, a, it, it, there's a video toolbox that talks about um, when the German um, the, uh, 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 a battle that took place in the Warsaw Ghetto for the flags. There were flags they hung up in one of the squares. They hung up the Zionist flag, which is like the Israeli flag, and they hung up the Polish flag. And it was there for, I believe it was four days. And it incensed the Germans. They couldn't get it down. And so I just come to my last slide here. OK, that when we talk about the uprisings in the ghettos and the camps, I just want to bring to the words of Anchuk Zuckerman, who um, was, again, an underground fighter in the Warsaw Ghetto, but also not only that, in the Polish uprising that took place in August of, 19, of August of 1944. So he was a real warrior. He really was. And on the 25th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto uprising on the radio in Israel, this is what he says. He says, I don't think there's any real need to analyze the uprising in military terms. This was a war of less than a thousand people against a mighty army, and no one doubted how it was likely to turn out. This isn't a subject for study in a military school, not the weapons, not the operations, not the tactics. If there's a school to study the human spirit, there it should be a major subject. The really important things were inherent in the force shown by Jewish youth after years of degradation to rise up against their destroyers and determine what debt they would choose, Treblinka or uprising. I don't know if there's a standard to measure that. Okay. And so we will conclude with that. And I will just say that, um, again, I'm just going to emphasize that our students can learn a lot less from knowing that a million Jews were gassed in Auschwitz then they can learn um, by knowing how the Jews lived while the Holocaust was happening, not how they died, but how they lived. And that was, I hope, a focus um, today and that you understood that. And this idea of the Jews were doing things as Gail said in the beginning, they were literally fighting back day in and day out, but just in a different kind of way. Okay, and so we will end with that. Irvin, okay. you are on. Thank and you, Lori. Lori, we'll, <laughs> we're going to formally thank you at the end. We're going to talk. Yes. But Irvin, okay, so people had questions. Yeah. Yes. Wait, I can't hear. Wait, I lost. Hold on. I can't hear anymore. Oh, can oh there you we hear go. Us? Now oh, I can hear okay. you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, Lori, I'm going to try to move quickly. <laughs> we do have a lot of questions, but okay. um, the first one is uh, mm -hmm. where did the. Um, people in the ghetto get the costumes, the instruments, wasn't everything taken away? Okay, so there were a lot. Okay, so this is, it's, it's a really good question. Um, first of all, sometimes they were allowed to bring X amount with them, what they could carry on their back, what they could bring with them. Um, and different people brought different things. It's, it, it's, it's a whole lesson we have on what they brought with them. We know, for example, just to give you in the Theresienstadt ghetto, right, we saw the students that made the magazines. There was a woman, her name was Friedel Dicker, um, Friedel Dicker, Dicker Brandeis. And 
she brought literally her entire suitcase full of art supplies. And she, but we talk about being, um, we talk about being um, trailblazers. She really was, I believe, um, a trailblazer when it came to art therapy. She already knew the war was difficult for children. And now they're being, they don't know where they're going. She says, whatever, wherever we go, these children are going to need help. And she fills her suitcase with art supplies. So to answer your question, we don't always know. But and also, like I said, different ghettos were different. So in some ghettos, they were allowed to bring more. Some ghettos, they were allowed to bring less. Their number, Yad Vashem counts 1,100 ghettos. 1,100 of them. Some were more sealed than others. Some were more, Some a lot of them were sealed and closed, but you could sm smuggle and smuggle out. Some of them were open, but the Jews were supposed to be there. Um, so I can't exactly answer how they had those, but people were allowed to bring in things. The question is how much room they had to store them. The question is, and we can see, we can imagine that for artists and for musicians bringing their violin or bringing their uh, whatever they played with them was a high priority. And for religious people, maybe it was a prayer book to include or their candlesticks where they light for the Sabbath or things like that. You know, it was, and, and again, since you brought it up, when we're teaching the Holocaust and you're teaching your students about these situations, think about it. People had to pack their lives, right? And it's something to think about what, where our priorities lie, you know, and we never do. I just have to add this because I'm an educator and this is what we do. We don't do role playing. Please do not ask your students, what would you bring with you? They will naturally do that themselves and that's okay, right? But you can ask them, how do, we, how do we see what was important to people by what they brought, right? How do, we, how, how do we view the things in our lives? And it can, you know, it can be a very meaningful discussion on what it means to have things, what it means to have things that are given to you by people, the value, things like that. Okay. So I hope that answered the question. Thank you. That was excellent. I put in the chat because those of us that were with us yesterday with Liz Elsby, oh, yeah. like you guys coordinated it. She talked about Frieda, Frieda, <laughs> Frieda Dicker, Dicker Brandeis. Brandeis. I put her name yes. in the chat. Yes. Yeah. And in the States, we often refer to role playing as simulations. Simulations. Yes, echo you know. Echoing exactly what you said. Please don't do the simulation. And Doug and Steve, you remember in the olden days, so many years ago, you were to pick a mayor and the mayor would decide, you know, pseudo mayor in your classroom. Don't no. do any of that anymore. Don't do it. No Something more. Else. We've learned that is not the way. Thank you. Right. Early but we try. can. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question is, uh, did the Nazis know about the plays and did they happen to attend them? So, it, so it's interesting. It, sometimes yes and sometimes no. Um, in some cases, they would give instruction. You can't. You can have a play, but you can't do this. It, it, so what people need to understand about the ghettos is that in, in many ways, it was life went on just in really, really extreme conditions. And in, in many cases, the, the Germans kind of, and that's why they had a, a Judenrat, a Jewish council. They didn't really want to deal so much with the day-to-day. -day. They put the Jews in charge themselves. And sometimes, you know, their attitude was, well, let them do what they want now because, you know, it, you know, we, we, we know the conditions they're in, let them be happy. But sometimes they did say you can't do it. So for example, in the Vilna ghetto, they had, I believe it was one or two schools that were official schools, but then they had underground schools because they wanted to have even more. They were allowed to have some, but they couldn't have all of them. So sometimes they were allowed to have plays and you could see that El Dorado theater was, was outside, but sometimes they had underground theaters where they were doing performances. Um, and in Theresienstadt ghetto, I believe they, they definitely have theater and I believe that there were performances that it's well known that the Germans came to the performances. So, yeah, but it, it differed in each case. It's very, it's, I mean, it's, very interesting to learn about. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, this is a question from an educator. Um, I am a preschool teacher. Do you have any recommendations on how to incorporate the concepts of being a neighbor or maybe even resistance to them? Um, so oh, I don't have it here with me because we have a seminar. Oh, I was just checking. Um, when it comes to teaching younger students, if you, I, 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 we recommend possibly starting in third or fourth grade. And the reason why we don't start 
we recommend starting earlier, and that's a whole lecture unto itself, but I'll, I'll try to do it in just <laughs> a minute or two here um, that, that I give. Now, the reason why is because we do believe that it's there, we can teach the Holocaust using building blocks, so to speak. And if they're younger, they can learn about the Holocaust, they can learn about people who survived and people that came out on the other end, and they um, then, then we're actually minimizing their anxiety levels instead of building it. If they ask questions and we don't give them answers that build anxiety in children. And if, again, what I said before or earlier about building up resilience, I believe it or not, again, it sounds counterintuitive maybe, but by learning about a bad time and people who came out from it, we're building resilience in our children instead of, instead of the, the opposite. Now, um, that being said, that we have certain tools for teaching the Holocaust to younger children. And again, like I said, it, it's a whole it's a whole lecture. But keep in mind, just because you're teaching the Holocaust, they don't have to know everything. So I'll give you an example. Loss, unfortunately, at any age is age appropriate. Children, I mean, they lose grandparents. I mean, loss, death. They lose grandparents. Or, you know, in certain cases, unfortunately, they lose parents or siblings or a neighbor or somebody. Mass, mass murder is not age appropriate for young children. But unfortunately, loss always is. So you can teach loss, but you can teach it properly. For really, really young students, we have um, a unit called Tommy, and it's a primary resource. It is a birthday book that was made for a three-year-old in the Teresa Stock Ghetto by his father. And you can use it. And if they want to, if you want to touch upon it, it's, it, it doesn't talk about helping others. I mean, you, you can't definitely talk about helping others in it, but it's a book about Tommy being a three-year-old and there's different images in there and there's images with his parents and but really what you can say is it was a time it was very tough there's a little boy by the name of Tommy and Tommy was um, in the Holocaust and his father gave him this book and you know what was so special about the book that his father made for him that whenever Tommy was sad he could look at the book and it made him feel better now in that little lesson there you're and then you can look at the book and it comes with cards um yeah thank you <laughs> um and um it, 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 you're teaching coping mechanisms you're teaching them fam the strength of family bonds of um human interaction uh you're teaching them there's all, all a bunch of different things that are in tommy and that we you can use really from they use it here in israel because we on on on, inter, on holocaust memorial day here in israel a siren goes off we can't avoid teaching it so we don't avoid it, but, but we teach it very, very age appropriately. And using that, even that one resource can be used year after year, adding to their level of knowledge until third or fourth grade when we start teaching them in story format about the Holocaust. And like I said, we don't have to give them everything when they're younger, but it's building blocks. So when they're older, they can contain the tougher information. So I hope that answered your question. Let Thank me you, just, um <laughs> say that my first degree is in early childhood education yeah. and I'm putting on my hat as a friend of Doug Survey to say that in New Jersey, we yeah. recommend that the H word Holocaust is not introduced until the right. fifth grade. But I did right. put okay, so one we... book in the chat, which mm -hmm. I use for with early childhood educators. We're different, we're the same. It's a great introduction about respect, right. being good and kind to each other. And um, we have a whole unit planned through the state right. of New Jersey, just go on their website. Uh, perhaps Doug, right. uh, you so can I would, put right. in the chat how they access that and they can get that teaching unit right. for the early childhood right. educators. Right. And that's, Thank I you. mean, I would call that, and correct me if I'm wrong, Gail, but I would call that Holocaust readiness. Meaning you're you don't getting use them prepared. The word. I just want I, to I under, say. no, you don't use the word, but I'm saying, in other words, in terms from an educator's point point of view, in Israel, we and I'm talking about in Israel or in Jewish day schools, for example, in Jewish schools where they're doing um, let's say a ceremony for fourth through eighth grade, and the young younger children see it and they have questions. So if you need to talk about the Holocaust, right. you can do, do, do it this way. Right. Um, and it's a primary source. And um, he, he's a survivor. It's always with a survivor. So they see that somebody went in, but somebody came out. We call it safely in and safely out. Right. Um, Thank you. All right. We've got to move on. Anybody else? Next question. I think uh, we have to move on. Uh, Professor Rosenthal, I think it's 1030. 
you're on mute. Okay, Sorry. I will put I, what I I'll put my email in here in case anybody thank you. has any questions right, I wasn't I, able to Irvin, answer. Just a yes. quick question: If you're looking at the questions you didn't ask, is there one that's shouting out to you that perhaps several asked the same? We do have time for one more question. I don't want to end. Like, there is one uh, okay. that's been asked multiple times. Uh, Lori, uh, educators are asking, um, is your presentation online or where can we find the images, the information that you use today on the echoes and reflections? Well, first of all, a lot. Yeah, I, I, I did my best to take a lot of stuff from from the echoes and reflections lesson. Um, and I'm happy to send the presentation to Gail and she can send it out or I don't. I'm trying to think if this presentation was recorded and put on YouTube, because a few of mine are in some space. If if it is, I'll also send that link to Gail so she can pass it along. Um, okay, and we will. Sure. We that will be my homework. I will send it to you. This is like you know when I'm after my teenage grandchildren, and your job is to do our evaluations for us today. And let me say this so that it's not a misunderstanding. And Lori, I assume you're going to agree with me that 95% yeah. of Lori's presentation is Instacart. It's there right, right now. There. So all you them. do is Google and tell me if I'm saying anything wrong, echoes and reflections, and then go to the unit area that is about armed and spiritual resistance. All you do is put that in and boom, nine and also, five. yeah, and you'll have ideas of what how to use the material in the classroom as well. Right. And and Very what hard. they do, and you'll find even more. And what they do, this is a shout out, fantastic, is when we all use Instacart, we're not going to get you know all detergent and palm olive and all that. But Echoes and Reflections gives you all the different resources. And you decide what's best for your class because you know your students best of all. And not only that, but every year our students change. You know, just when we think, oh, this is the way to do it, then we have a more mature class or an immature class, or we have a class that was touched by some tragedy, then maybe, you know, we're going to change how we're going to do it that year. So let's all clap for Lori because you were great. Thank you. Thank you. I and take it as a big compliment that they want to know how can we get her <laughs> presentation. And just as important, I do. I do. we hope you'll come to but, Stockton sometime with Cheryl and Yoni. You'll just all, you know, hop on a plane. Well, and thank, get to thank you, Gail, for asking me to be here. And thank you, everybody, for coming. Like I said, we say here you are doing God's work when you educate the next generation. So um, I wish all the best of luck and come back and. Come, come visit us here in Israel. <laughs> right, and maybe we will. We're hoping to continue that bridge. And we're just, um, Yoni, I know you're on. Can you give us a wave? Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. So this is my friend Yoni. I'm so excited. Um, I just need to uh, take about two and a half, three minutes to have a commercial. Of course, you'll rate this because, you know, I'm like on TV now, right? And you're our media expert. So I wanted to just take <clears throat> a minute or two uh, to tell everybody about our Holocaust Center because we didn't do that in the beginning. So welcome to the Sarah and Sam Show for Holocaust Resource Center at Stockton University. We'll go right to the next slide. And we just want to show what our our campus looks like in 15 miles north of Atlantic City. We do have the campus in Atlantic City also, right at the boardwalk. Uh, and um, on Stockton's campus, we're the second floor of the library. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is our main entrance. And if you notice over the entrance are three railroad tracks and they are from Bialystok, Poland which was a main switching station, taking victims to concentration camps, death camps, and slave labor camps. And adjacent to this are um, display cases. The first case um, next to the door is dedicated to 
a Holocaust survivor from Benjamin Poland. And um, we tell her story by the artifacts that she had given us. The next case is dedicated to Ellie Wiesel's quote, all Jews were victims, not all victims were Jews. It's dedicated, <coughs> excuse me, to the Roma and the Sinti. And the last case, which you can see, is dedicated to our World War uh, II um, military veterans. And um, every time we have students come, we ask, do you have anybody in your family that's a veteran? They say, yes, but I don't know the story. So it encourages students to get their own life stories. We're gonna go right into our classroom number one. And in this classroom, you see there are images on the wall, photographs of our local Holocaust survivors. We're in a unique area surrounded by Atlantic, Cape May and Cumberland counties. And within 40, 45 miles of the university, we have currently identified over 1,500 Holocaust survivors that came to our area, which is amazing. On Irvin, am I right? Over 300 chicken farms at this point, poultry farms? I think we're close to 400. All right, let's go for it. We're hitting the 400. Um, poultry farms, we've started a project called Holocaust Survivors of South Jersey, tracing all of their life stories. And um, we encourage you to get involved with your students with this project. If you're interested, just get in touch with me after today. And in our classroom, we have a University of Southern California um, Shoah Foundation project. And it's an interactive biography. Many of you will call it a hologram. And yes, you're right, it is a hologram, but by contract, we're not supposed to call it that. And it's a hologram of a Holocaust survivor. And um, when we first got it, we weren't sure how effective it was going to be, but when we put the lights out down and the students talk to the survivor and they're able to ask him questions that they wouldn't necessarily be comfortable asking a survivor that was in front of them, like, are you happy? How do you cope with post-traumatic stress syndrome? Do you have it? That kind, that those types of questions. It's amazing. We've we've seen our students tear up in conversation with Ed. Ed Mossberg is from the. He is 96 years old, and he's from the Newark, New Jersey area. So if you bring your students to come meet Ed, of course they have to be prepared when we would give you Ed's history. Um, we can um, fund your buses to Stockton University. And if you're a high school teacher, we can even treat them, all high school students to lunch. I think we have one more photo to share with you and that's our exhibit area. And um, Irvin, if you would go right to that map, many of your students have read the diary of Anne Frank and on the map is where she was hidden <clears throat> excuse me, and just a couple blocks away, Leo Ullman was also a hidden child. His life story is different. He survived. We have all of his artifacts um, and we have an interactive uh, screen where students can learn more about the Netherlands and about Leo Ullman and those that rescued him. And those of you that are familiar with rescue know that it's not just an act of one person. We show the full networking of it. So I think that's our last slide, correct? So come on down, please join us. We'd love to have you. We're open Monday through Friday. Um, as all of our programs are, it's absolutely free. And just get in contact with us. I think Irvin or Matt will put our contact information uh, in the uh, chat.